Hi, and welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church. My name is Michael Cromwell, and I have the joy of serving as one of the associate pastors here at RUMC. Thanks for joining us for our on-demand version of the sermon, which will be delivered later today. If you'd like to watch our services live, you can do so via our live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15. Notice our different worship times and our different hours that we have now. You'll also be able to see the entire worship service on demand later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. We are so glad that you are with us today. We're thankful for your presence and we're thankful for your generosity and the different ways that you are helping to make RUMC a place of community and faith. Let's have a word of prayer before we hear our sermon. Gracious and loving God, we love you so much and we are grateful for this day and this day that we have to worship you. May the words that we are to hear, may they not only pierce our ears, but pierce our hearts as well, that we might be changed in different people because of what you have to say to us today. We thank you and we love you all in Christ's name we pray, amen. Now let's hear our sermon from today. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of John chapter 12, and I'll be reading verses 12 through 19. And this is what it says. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees and went out to meet him. And they began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. And Jesus, finding a young donkey, sat on it, as it is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion, behold your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things were written of him and that they had done these things to him. And so the multitude who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing him witness. For this cause also the multitude went and met him, because they heard that he had performed this sign. The Pharisees therefore said to one another, You see that you are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, may it be breathed with your power that we know not only information about you, but that we know you. Use this time to do exactly that. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Robert Fulgham talks about a time when his daughter Molly, seven years old, enjoyed preparing lunch for him and for her brothers. She would make a sack lunch, usually included a sandwich, an apple, and sometimes a, a note and a treat. Well, on this particular morning, Molly gave him two sacks, not one. One had his lunch in it, and the other was secured with duct tape paper clips and some staples. Well, her dad said, what is this? She said, oh, it's just some stuff. I thought you'd like it. Well, when he got to work, he didn't think much about it. Lunchtime came, he opened up his briefcase and he pulled out the two sacks. His sack of lunch, he began eating and the other sack he opened up. And he was kind of surprised what was in it. It was two hair ribbons, three small stones, a plastic dinosaur a pencil stub, a tiny seashell, two animal crackers, a marble, a used lipstick, a small doll, two chocolate kisses, and 13 pennies. And he said, huh, what's this? Well, when he finished eating, he raked it with the rest of the trash over into the trash can. At the end of the day, he was reading the paper, and Molly came up and stood next to him and said, where's my sack? He said, what sack? said, the sack I gave you this morning, they were my special things, the things that mean the most to me. Uh-oh. He said, well, I, I left it at work. She said, you didn't throw it away, did you? He lied. He said, no, I put it aside so I could get it later, and I just forgot. <laughs> there she had given him all the things that she enjoyed the most, her eyes began to well with tears. She said, you didn't 
throw it away, did you? Those are my special things. I thought you would enjoy playing with them while you ate your lunch. He goes on to write, she gave me love in a paper sack, and I had missed it. Sometimes when people share their love with it, sometimes we just miss it. We just miss it. And the disciples, the disciples right here in John chapter 16, they, they had missed it the first time. And this is what it says. It says, these things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered these things were written off him. It was when Jesus rose from the grave. It was his resurrection. When, they came, when Jesus came and visited them, that's when their eyes were opened that he had given a gift of love all along. And then it's they, they remembered that love. They remembered. They remembered. And here they're writing about the love of Jesus that they would remember. And that's what I want to speak about this morning. That they remembered. They remembered that Jesus gave the power of peace. Jesus gave the power of peace. Verse 15, this is what it says. It is written, Fear not, daughter of Zion. Behold, your king comes sitting on a donkey's colt. Jesus came not riding a stallion. He came not with, the, with instruments of war or force. Jesus came riding a donkey's colt. He came in peace. And he came to give the, the power of peace. You may not remember the name Margaret Rose Powers, but chances are pretty good you may remember her poem. It was called Footprints. Millions have found it very inspirational. Well, she has been interviewed about how she came to write the poem. She said she was 20 years old and she had meningitis. She was recovering at the family farm in Ontario. She said that she was unable to get out of the bed for, for months. She, and she wrote down in her diary, she said, I never felt so empty and afraid. And then she wrote the words, Lord, have you left me too? Well, her brother tried to cheer her up. So after she got a little better, he said, can I take you to lunch? said when they were going to lunch, they bumped into a, a friend of his, a fellow named Paul. And Paul asked if he could go along with them. said later on, Paul would ask her out for a date. Several months went by, and Paul asked her to marry him. She said that they were walking along the shore at Lake Erie, and that's when Paul looked back and said, See our footprints, Margie? On the day we marry, they will become like one set, not two. She went on to say that that image of seeing their footprints in the sand, that it stayed with her that night. And she went back. And she said it was, it was like a dream that she began to, to write about the time in her life that she'd gone through, the, the hard and the difficult time. And when she had asked the question, Lord, have you left me too? That when she began to write this out, she said, dear Lord, I wrote, where are you when I needed you so badly? And you let me know. You let me know, my precious child, I love you and I will never leave you. When you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. Jesus gives the power of peace. Yes, in the hard and the difficult time. And he rose. His first words were, peace be with you. And all through his life, he gave his disciples those words, fear not. 
It was during his life he gave his disciples then and now the words, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives. If we're looking for peace from this world, we'll never receive it. But Jesus gives the power of peace, the power of peace that he never leaves us, that in the hard and the difficult time that he carries us. He gives his peace. He gives his peace. This morning, the invitation is, take it. Take it. That when Jesus rose from the grave, he gave peace. And this morning, take it. Take it. It's there for you. He rose from the grave, not just as a symbol. He rose from the grave to live his life through you and through me. Jesus gave the power of peace. My invitation is, this morning, take it. But not only that, Jesus, Jesus gave the power over death. Verse 17 says, And so when the multitude who were with him, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing him witness. Strange thing. They remembered that Lazarus and the people who were bearing witness with Lazarus that they were there. Well, that was about a week ago. That was about a week ago that Jesus and his disciples were at a place that John calls beyond the Jordan. Well, that's just code for it. They were in the middle of the boondocks. And someone came to Jesus saying, your friend Lazarus is sick. Well, Lazarus lived in Bethany, and Bethany was only two miles from Jerusalem. They had a journey to get there, and by the time they got there, Lazarus wasn't sick anymore. He was dead. It was then that Jesus went to the tomb of Lazarus, and it tells us Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the whole of the Bible, that Jesus wept. And I think it may be one of the most pastoral verses in the whole of the Bible, Jesus wept. But that's not all he did that this is what disciples remember, that Jesus called for the stone to be rolled away and he shouted down death. He said, Lazarus, come out. And out walked Lazarus four days dead in the grave. Word traveled and it grew. So here, a week later, when he walks in Jerusalem, the memory of him having the power over death, that it's here. And Jesus still has the power over death. And that's what I want to talk about this morning. That Jesus has the power over death. Reverend Shannon Kirshner, a Presbyterian pastor, talks about a, a parishioner of hers who is in that deep, dark place called depression. She was in a deep depression and, and she was in a hole in a hole, feeling very much alone. Well, Reverend Kirshner had just graduated from seminary. She was fresh out of seminary, and as she listened to her parishioner talk, she remembered the Psalms of lament, that people talk about the beauty of the Psalms, and yes, they're beautiful, but there, there are other parts of the Psalms where it, the anger and the frustration with God that the psalmist is expressing it freely, and it, it begins to flow. And Reverend Kirshner thought maybe the parishioner could be helped by these psalms of lament. And she reads a few of the psalms to her parishioner, and then she says to her, she says, see, what you feel is right here. It's faithful to feel, to feel this way, even when you feel God's absence. It's right here in the Psalms that God is in the pit with us, that God is present. And that's when her parishioner said, Shannon, I don't want a God who will sit with me in the pit. I want a God who will pull me out of it. And that's what Jesus did. Yes, Jesus wept. But he didn't stay there weeping. 
that he called Lazarus out of death and he calls you and me out of that dark place as well. He has the power over death not just long ago, but for you and me today. When Jesus rose from the grave, he rose to live his life through us, to pull us out of that pit of death. It's a power, a power available to you and me, and the invitation is there before us today. That Jesus gives that power, that power over death. Take it. Take it. My invitation to you today is take it. Take that power. But not only does Jesus give power over death, not only does Jesus give the power of peace, but Jesus gives power, power for life. Power for life. The, the disciples said they remember this when Jesus was glorified. Well, when Jesus was glorified when Jesus rose from the grave that John tells us that he, he met the disciples behind closed doors and it says and he breathed on them and said receive the Holy Spirit. Why is it important that Jesus breathed on them? Because that's exactly what God did to Adam in Genesis chapter 2. It says, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and he became a living being. It's the breath of God, the Spirit of God that gives life. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And there, there at the end of his gospel, John writes in John 20, verse 31, These things I've written to you that you may believe. Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Life, life is, was, was given to you and me to be lived, not to be captured in our minds, not to be thoughts or ideas. But the Holy Spirit living through you and through me. Earl Palmer wrote a little book called The Enormous Exception. And in this book, he's interviewing a, a young man who, who became Christian. And he asked him, how is it that he became a Christian in his spiritual journey? And the young man said, well, there was a time when I was a pre-med student at University of California, Berkeley. He said, that was the time that tipped the scales for me in my spiritual journey. It was because of a Christian friend. He said that he had had the flu and he had missed 10 days of class, but all during the time that he had missed that this Christian friend, without fanfare, without complaint, had gathered his assignments together and each day would bring him his assignments and go over the lectures. He would take his time to go over the lectures and what had been done that day. The young man went on to say, said, do you know this kind of thing just isn't done? I wanted to know what made this guy act the way he did. I even found myself asking if I could go to church with him. Jesus lives his life through Christians, through you, through me. But the question's there. Can the life of Jesus be seen in your life? Is there enough there to be the tipping point for someone? Through the act of kindness, the act of caring, with the taking time, without fanfare and without complaint. Jesus rose he rose from the grave to live his life through you and through me. Not only that, that we would have the power for life, but 
that that power for life would be given to others through our words, through our actions. This morning, it may be that when I'm again talking about that act of kindness, that act of caring, taking your time without fanfare, without complaint, giving it to another, that um, you realize that you've been in a place where complaining comes easy. And you've been thinking about where you are rather than reaching out to others. I have good news that the risen Christ is alive today, ready to live his life through you. And that's my invitation for you. That maybe you've taken a step or two to, to walk away. But this day, you want to turn back. Well, you can do just that, and I want to pray with you. Join with me in prayer. Jesus, many times in this life, uh, this is complaining comes easy. We like making the fanfare. We like making the noise. But very often it's in the fanfare and the complaining that people, well, they don't see your life in us. Breathe your life through us. Through that act of kindness, through that act of caring, and through the taking of time. Jesus, there also may be those this morning that are in a hard place, difficult place, in that deep, dark hole of depression. And that in the disciples remembering that you have power over death, that, well, that memory, that memory was sparked in them. Breathe the power of your spirit, a power that is stronger than death. It's a power that gives life in the here and now and in one step this day. One step this day, may they know the strength and the power in their lives. It also may be that there are folks this morning that have been struggling for peace. A peace that's, that's not come easy. You give peace. And it may be that we thought of peace as something out there for us to strive toward rather than something to be received. You tell us plainly, peace I give to you. Not as the world gives peace do I give. You've given it again and again and again. And Jesus, this morning we ask for power enough to receive it, power enough to, to take it because you've already given it to us. Not something we have to strive toward and earn and, and work toward, but to receive it. Peace enough to receive it. I'm thankful that you don't leave us alone. Not now and not ever. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thanks again for joining us today. Um, just a reminder, if you'd like to watch the entire worship service, you can do so via live stream at 9 o'clock and 11.15 a.m. You can also view the service on demand a little bit later this afternoon at rumc.com slash sermons. Also, if you have any prayer requests, we would love to hear about those. You can send those in to pray at rumc.com. Also, if you'd like to give of your tithes and your offerings, you can do that online as well. And that's at rumc.com slash giving. Uh, thanks again for joining us today and for honoring God with your presence. We hope and pray that you have a wonderful week and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Hi. Thank you for joining us. My name's Tom Davis. I'm senior pastor here at Roswell United Methodist Church. Our mission here at RUMC is to help people live a Christ-centered life. We're a welcoming church, we're a biblical church, and we're a compassionate church. 
That the, we believe that the way that, that God made us, that he made us in his image. And what the Bible tells us is that his image is an us, is an our. When God said in the creation story, let us create humans in our image, he made us to be in community together. He made us to connect to him and one another. That's the place that this is at Roswell United Methodist Church, a place of community and faith. I want to invite you to join us. It might be online, it might be through social media, or it might be here in person. We meet at 9 o'clock in a contemporary service with a band. We also have two 1115 services. One is here in the sanctuary with a traditional choir and organ. We also meet at 1115 with a band in our chapel. Thank you for joining us, and I look forward to meeting you.